I'm Jack Osborne, and you're listening. This is Nathan Hammond, and you're listening to... I'm Richard C. Hoagland, and you're listening to... I'm Mark Bell, and you're listening to Dr. J Radio Live. We have an unidentified flying object. All right, we are on finally with Uri Geller, a very esteemed topic guest who we've been you know, researching for quite some time, and gratefully we have on this show finally, and I'm very glad for all of you, the listener, who are able to hear him, the one and only Mr. Uri Geller. Uri, welcome to the show. Hey, Dr. J, thanks very much, and to your co-host, Joni. Hi, everyone, and I'm very happy that you invited me onto your show. Well, I wanted to start back because you, you know, you you're became an instant legend, literally, in the 70s. And you still are, to this day, revered, you know, and one of the top people for motivational speaking, ESP, and everything else. So what started your career in the 70s, I guess, in your late teens, early 20s? Um, okay. First of all, thank you very much for the nice compliment. Uh, let's go back now to 19... 19- 65, uh, when I joined the Israeli paratroopers. In uh, 1966, I fought in the Six Day War, uh, in which I actually uh, was wounded. Then I um, finished my three year term and I was broke. I had no money. But I had a very unusual talent. I had a skill, and that was spoon bending, it was mind reading. I was demonstrating my abilities in small groups here actually in Tel Aviv. Everyone was amazed. Everyone was astonished. These little house parties became more prestigious from photographers to lawyers to judges to generals. And then one day, Prime Minister Golda Meir was in one of these parties. And I, I'll never forget that evening. I handed her a marker. I told her to go to the toilet. And I said to her, draw a secret drawing in there. Fold it up, come out, and I'll read your mind. And being the Prime Minister of Israel, she said immediately to me that nobody can read her mind. But she did what I wanted. She went, you know, to the restroom. She came out, she did um, a secret drawing, I looked into her eyes, and I duplicated it. And of course, she was very impressed. The next day, she was being interviewed on Israeli radio, and the presenter asked her, Prime Minister Golda Meir, what do you predict for the future of Israel? And she said, without hesitation, she said, don't ask me, Ask Uri Geller. And that was it. My telephone in my little tiny apartment where I lived with my mother started ringing. And entrepreneurs and managers were asking me one question. Can I demonstrate these powers or these skills on a big stage in front of thousands of people? Since I wanted to be rich and famous, I said, yes, yes, how much am I going to make? (laughs) Um, I was, you know, very and rather shallow at those times, but all I cared really, Dr. J, is to buy my mother a television to stop her from working. That was my target, to help my mom. And I found myself in no time on the biggest stages of Israel in front of two, three, four, five thousand people and everyone was mind blown and what fascinates me until today is that my demonstrations are rather trivial I'm no David Copperfield I'm no David Blaine I'm no Chris Angel my demonstrations were very small but I guess because they were very down to earth and they were very believable it it took off. My career took off in Israel. Now, to make a long story short, at the same time, the American Defense Department, this is 1969-70, where they were worried that the Russians were honing, they were sharpening the powers of psychics, of Russian psychics who could 
um, knockout um, electricity bulbs. They could move matches under bell jars and so on. And they didn't have anyone in the West. Now, in one of my shows in Israel, which was in the Technion in Haifa, which is, of course, the um, a very prestigious university, there was an Israeli scientist who had a, 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 an American friend who had ties to the CIA. And he wrote him a letter about me. That scientist went to his superiors and said that there is a young guy in Israel called Uri Geller who bends metal with his mind. And the CIA said, get him, bring him to the United States. So that goes back to answer your question, Dr. J. In 1972, I got on a plane and took off and I flew to the United States to be tested by American scientists and of course the tests were funded by the American Defense Department. And I was going to just say exactly that, that you were funded by Stanford Research Institute. They were doing that for the psychic spies. That's exactly so. Um, the experiments were not funded by Stanford Research Institute. They were really getting the money from um, govern governmental sources. Defense. I, yeah. I would say from ARPA, from Advanced Research Project Agency, and probably the CIA and other sources, because they wanted to come down to the bottom of it. Is Uri Geller just a clever magician, or does he really have supernatural powers that they could harness? Here's a, an interesting question I wanted to ask you about. Uh, the, the man who ran Skunk Works for, uh, created the stealth plane, the F-117, uh, the SR-71, and what he gave a presentation at UCLA, this Department of Engineering for the alumni, at the very end of his presentation, he showed a flying disc, and he said, we now have technology in the Nevada desert to take E.T. home. And so the director of the Mutual UFO Network, you know, asked him how, you know, how does it work? You know, how, how are these things controlled? And what the reply was, was, do you know how ESP works? So obviously there was a connection with ESP and the, uh, the, the military, I guess, the craft, the extraterrestrial craft, and what we were able to reverse engineer. Uh, do you know anything about that? Well, look, I am a huge believer in alien life. I've never seen an alien, but I have seen UFOs, like many other, um, not hundreds of thousands, but millions of people worldwide have seen certain things in the sky that there is still no rational explanation to. One of the scientists that tested me beside Russell Targ and Hal Putoff was Captain Edgar Mitchell, who we all know was the sixth man to walk yes. on the moon. And sadly, yeah, he, he died. was um, uh, a very, very close friend of mine. And sadly, uh, we all know that he passed away just a few weeks ago. Now, Ed and I became very, very close friends. He visited my home in England. I visited him. We uh, emailed each other uh, all the time. I have, so, on a few occasions, Dr. J and Johnny, I've spoken to him about extraterrestrial life. Edgar yeah. was a genius. Uh, he, he was. was. A, a down-to-earth, yeah. a very clever scientist who, of course, was very controversial because of his ESP experiment while he was in outer space. But he, on many occasions, he and I would speak about extraterrestrial life that has visited our planet. He had inside information, not only information and knowledge, but he has seen artifacts that were directly related to a visitation of an extraterrestrial civilization that landed here on our planet. I had to believe Ed every word he said. 
beside me being a believer, what he told me was the truth. There are certain things uh, that I cannot go into because he asked me not to reveal them, at least not yet. But he was totally and utterly convincing. And then he also showed me pictures I, that I don't believe many people have seen that led me to believe 100% that there was an alien, some type of an alien knowledge, alien information that was left here on planet Earth and we took that information and tried to somehow reignite it and derive information from this alien source to be used for secret um, missions and secret uh, setups that certain governments were involved in. I'm glad you brought up Edgar Mitchell. He was a great friend of mine, and over the last five years, he's appeared on the show 11 times. And just like you said, he's talked about uh, the Roswell crash when he came back after coming from the moon. Uh, he had a lot over, I, there were about 600 plus witnesses, uh, military witnesses, civilian, police, everything that have come forward to him afterwards, when he, after he came back in 1972 to his hometown and told him about this and showed him this. He even said on air about the possibility of a base, an alien base on the other side of the moon. So I'm really glad you mentioned that because it actually confirms everything he said. It was a very tragic loss that we lost him. But back to the ESP ability. Is it possible for everyone else to gain access to this? Can we all gain access to what some people coin Akashic Records, you know, the infinite wisdom, or uh, the access to uh, the ability like you have to bend metal or to, um, to read minds? Like, for instance, I've seen a demonstration you did. I don't know which host it was. Maybe it was Barbara Walters. But she drew something, and then you ended up drawing it, and you, you first described it, you said it's either two people holding, each, uh, holding hands or uh, two mountain peaks. Then she showed her drawing, and it was identical to yours, and I thought that was fantastic. Thank you. Uh, look, Dr. J, um, all my television shows uh, were never actually under controlled conditions. So I guess this is why I became so controversial. And we will speak about it also, because controversy fueled the wheel of publicity. Most skeptics who attacked me didn't really understand what PR means and what publicity actually means. I used uh, their attacks on me and negative articles about me. I just, I, I, you know, and I'm saying this shamelessly, I still am, and I, I, I say it again shamelessly, so don't, don't, uh, look at it in a negative way. I'm a master publicist. So, I knew how to reinvent myself, and we'll, we'll speak about that later. But going back to ESP, the telepathy experiment that you should look at is really what I did under laboratory control condition. If you will allow me, uh, to mention my website, it's urigeller.com. That's www.urigeller.com, on which you will find some very interesting video films. One of them is called The Secret Life of Uri Geller, uh, in which uh, they basically exposed me as a CIA spy. And the other amazing film is actually from Stanford Research Institute. It's a half an hour film shot in 1972 under laboratory control conditions where I had to duplicate drawings that were drawn in shielded rooms outside uh, the experimentation room while I was in a shielded room and I had to duplicate them. And I, I'm saying this, and I'm not boasting, but I never failed. Every drawing they did, I duplicated. But then a CIA agent uh, who was then uh, attached to the CIA, Kit Green, he was in Langley, Virginia. I was in California. And he, he tested me by asking me what he was holding in his hand. 
and you know we're talking about the 70s there were no cellular phones there there was no facebook there was no twitter <laughs> you know there was no That's instagram right. there was no internet no internet and yeah no inter and i just basically drew exactly what was on a page in a book he was holding and i actually wrote a word out and um i you know it's hard for me to be, to to remember what i exactly wrote but it was something to do with the anatomy of of the body, which he wrote in his own handwriting on the page of that book. So it blew his mind, obviously, because I was thousands of miles away from him. Now, I did not say this to show off or to boast, but I just stated some facts. Now, you asked me if everybody could do this. And yes. are we all telepathic? My answer, Dr. J and Johnny, is that I believe that most humans are intuitive. But there are levels of intuition. There are those who are very intuitive, and some of these people are, are become remote viewers for the government. And as we speak, there are remote viewers helping the uh, American government and other intelligence services because we are going through very troubled times now where sometimes technolo technological invention and satellite cannot bring in certain information. And those people who are very intuitive have all kinds of extrasensory um uh, encounters in life. They read minds of others, they know when the phone is going to ring, or they, uh, you know, they dream things have come true and so on. Then there are people who are just very slightly intuitive, and they tell you stories about deja vu, that they go to places that they've never been before, and then they are amazed because they, they remember everything from that uh, space that they entered and so forth. But I do believe, Dr. J, that with practice and practice and practice, you can actually um, enhance your psychic ability. I don't really like the word psychic. I, I like the word intuitive. So I think that if you practice every day some extrasensory perception, ESP, telepathy with your friends, with your family, you can actually enhance and empower your telepathical, call it powers, call it energy, you may call it whatever you want to. With me, I don't really know how it started. I was a child. I was only five years old when I discovered that I could move the hands of a clock I could fix broken watches, I could read my mother's mind, and then a spoon broke in my hand. So at the very tender age of five, I realized that I was rather different than other children, and I had a mission. I wanted to get out of poverty. I wanted to climb out of the misery we were living in, and I thought that this would be my my path to success using my abilities. I'm glad you brought up remote viewing. Uh, that's a term that's very popular uh, and used in the, these days uh, to describe exactly what you did back in the 70s. And it was uh, different terms, terminology, you know, 40 plus years ago. And there was even a movie made about tele te telekinesis and the military using it. It's called The Men Who Stare at Ghosts. Even though it had a comedy spin at it, in the beginning, right out you know, front, it says, based on true events. Some people would say that the f certain foods are actually poisoning our minds and preventing this intuition from coming out. Would you agree with that? Um, okay, let's start with the movie. Uh, strangely enough, uh, I do believe that George Clooney played me in that film, and the synchronicity has it that both um, George Clooney 
bought a house next to my house in, in England. I mean, it's incredible that I've never met him, but just about a year ago he bought a house near my house. I also met Kevin Spacey, who, if I'm not mistaken, played in that film too. Right. And I have an interesting, um, I had an in, interesting meetings with him throughout the years with, with Kevin Spacey. So, yes, the film had a satirical tinge to it, but everything you saw, some obviously things were dramatized, but in, as a whole, the film was true. I am proud to say that I believe that I triggered the movie because the writer, John Ronson, actually visited my home and I think it was just after the 11th of September attack and he asked me about it and I told him that all of the remote viewers were reactivated and those words got him thinking and he actually wrote the book. Now, you mentioned something very interesting about food. Uh, did you mean literally food, things that we eat? Is that what you exactly. mean? Exactly. Yes, foods well, that may have toxins in them that prevent our minds from working properly for the intuition. Yeah. Yes. Look, Dr. J, 48 years ago, I became a vegetarian. I became a vegetarian because I don't want to kill animals. Parallel to that, when you enter any supermarket today and you fill up your trolley or your, your food basket, um, most people don't take the time to read the labeling. They don't read the ingredients of what certain companies put into the food that we consume. I guarantee you that you will be shocked what you are putting into your body. The chemicals, the food coloring, the preservatives, the fats. I mean, I can go on and on and on. You just well, Ari, pass, you just pass over nothing, right? the and, what? You know, as you're talking there, you know, what comes to mind immediately as you say these things is, is substances that are like sweetener additives called aspartame and the dangers of this thing that seems to be in all of our children's drinks everywhere and you know, everywhere. they're not aware of it. People just don't consciously take it in. No, because it's in small lettering, Johnny. You know, in a supermarket, you want to go, everything, you know, evolves around doing things quickly, quickly, swiftness. Uh, so very rarely do I see a mother with a child lift up a can of something that she bought and read the label, you know, what the ingredients. So I started researching that myself. And I came to the conclusion that some of the stuff they put in food is poison. They're poisoning us slowly but surely. All the ease, all the coloring. If you just Google it today, today we have got Google. So you can very quickly find out what E241 and all those other uh, n dangerous additives that they're putting in foods. You just go home, Google this, and you're going to be shocked at the you know, cancer-causing elements that they put in food. Now, going back, Dr. J, to your question, the answer is, of course. I mean, if it poisons you, it doesn't only poison your body, it poisons your mind. It poisons your soul. It poisons your spirit. And if we are intuitive, and if we do have certain psychic abilities, only God knows what those poisons do to our mental abilities. So that's my answer. Well, when you became a vegetarian, did you notice that some of your abilities were enhanced? Because I'm glad you brought up these all these ingredients because for instance i'm holding a can of red bull and i'm looking at all these ingredients i can't even pronounce half of them and, and you're right I, some of them i've googled myself and found to uh, contain fluoride or other poisons uh, the answer is yes my my abilities were heightened sharpened empowered you you and every positive word that you can 
invent now uh, is yes, I became clearer, I had more energy, I could exercise for longer times, my heart rate dropped, um, I became healthier, full stop, healthier, happier, I had more peace of mind, I could meditate for longer, I could dive for longer periods in the seas and rivers and oceans. So, yes, I purified myself and my family, because we all became vegetarian, by cutting down the poisons that we were eating uh, and getting in the food. But, by the way, even when you eat, pick up apples and fruit and vegetables, if you don't go to a bona fide organic uh, food market, then even the beautiful red apples that you pick up, you know, they're waxed to look shiny. Um, there are vegetables that are colored in green and yellow to look fresher and greener and yellower and redder and more attractive and more, uh, more kind of making you want to buy that food stuff because it looks better. And these companies continue poisoning us. Uh, let, let's not even, I, mean, I can go into um, air pollution. What about the companies that are still manufacturing cigarettes? I mean, they're in the business. Cigarette manufacturers are in the business of killing us. You're I'll really repeat that to... again. And I ask you, do, do you think that there is a, you know, a depopulation of the planet that they want of, you know, 95%, they want this 500 million, and, uh, do you know, do you think there's a new world order? Because what you talk about, sounds like you say they, that, you know, in this case we understand it to be big corporate cake, you know, conglomerates and, you know, holding power and holding the power of food and, and subsidies around the world. But do you believe there's a new world order? Um, look, Johnny, you're kind of a bit entering the conspiracy theories. Um, I'm very careful, you know, when I hear conspiracy theories and so on. I believe in many of them, but yeah. I'm very careful how I present them. I didn't mean to be offensive when I said New World Order, but I felt in the context of the conversation that you were saying, um, it, it reminded me of when I hear Gordon Brown, the former Prime Minister Chancellor, uh, when he mentions New World Order, and then I hear George Bush in... Mentioned yeah, term, we actually had really Michael Dukakis say that. Yeah, My, Michael Dukakis, former presidential candidate, when he was on, that, I can't believe he said that. I, you know, we were talking politics, and, and the it, last sentence, that's what he said. But yeah, but, so the agenda um, for the new world order, in my understanding, is, is a depopulation. It, it, it's apparently um, not sustainable with the, the way the things run, and so they they do this. And so, unfortunately, it seems to be in our own lifetime, we keep experiencing... Uh, these genocides from their own countries, Russia, China, um, you know, other countries in the past, I'm sure. Um, it seems to be like they want to sort of set this up, this event. So we've got a militarization of police, uh, in, from army into police. So, you know, I, I, I sort of put that in that sense. I thought you had a, an understanding of, of that, but for, for, for that, I apologize, you know. For sure. Let me put it this way, uh, Dr. J and Johnny, the world is turning around on one thing and one thing only. And it's spelled M-O-N-E-Y. Money. In short, it's money. Everything is about money. Everything today is about power. That's what it is all about. The money that is on our planet Earth is owned by a very small group of people, a very tiny group of people. They're big multinational conglomerates. They churn around. It's all about profit. Even this, you know, I don't know if you have commercials, Dr. J, on your radio show. Yes. But if you don't have commercials, then bottom line, it's about money too. Money. All the radio stations, all the television stations, whether it's internet-based, not internet-based, terrestrial, they all have ratings. Everyone is running about and, and so it's all about ratings. CBS, 
NBC, ABC, Fox, etc., 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 etc. All they care is about ratings. If your ratings are high, you're in. If you are, your ratings are low, they are, you're out. This is what the elections are about. Trump is leading because he's controversial. He has a certain charisma. He is a showman and he talks from the heart. People love that. People are fed up. So he is in. So his rating is high. And whoever is going to win the presidency will win it because they charmed their way into the American public. For nothing else. It's about charisma. It's about charm. It's about self-confidence. And it's about what you tell the American public. And at the end of the day, bottom line, Donald Trump is a wealthy man. People like that. People say he's a billionaire, so he's going to make us a better country. And that, you know exactly what I'm saying, Dr. J. And I think inside your heart, you know that I'm right. Yes. Yeah, he is. And as a matter of fact, he tells it like it is. And that's why his polls are so high. He's leading in virtually every poll. I mean, I, I have no doubt he's going to become the Republican candidate. I mean, it's just no, no doubt. He's already a quarter of the way there at this point. Exactly. The and, and the reason we kind of spilled over into politics and Trump and so on is it's, it's from the foodstuffs and the cigarettes. Everybody wants to earn as much money as possible. So they need to put preservatives in food to keep it longer on the supermarket shelves so it doesn't go bad, so they don't have to send it back, etc., etc., etc. I think your, all your listeners are wise people. They are, they are, you know, they are mature and they, they get what I'm saying. And I think that everyone, I, I bet that all of your listeners will agree with us that it is the world runs on one sentence. It's all about money. That's right. That's right. And that's what I fear because you have big pharmaceuticals that are poisoning everybody. Mm -hmm. I, I think the cancer rates are much higher than the previous generations. I fear for the future of the children and our children's children. Absolutely. That is what, yeah. And, and you've done a lot of help with children. You've encouraged them to eat healthy and you've done a lot more. You want to tell us, uh, tell the listeners about specifically what else you continue to do? Okay, With the help? look, first of all, uh, very important that you all understand that I'm not a healer, I'm not a miracle worker, I'm not a guru, I'm just a very down-to-earth person who knew how to handle media, I originated spoon bending, I'm very surprised how I managed to instill it into world culture, movies like you said, well, uh, the man who stared the goat, George Clooney, um, three years ago, Robert De Niro played me in a movie called Red Light. The Matrix has a whole scene of spoon bending. Johnny Cash sang about spoon bending. So did Kenny Rogers. So I'm very surprised, and I think that's the phenomenon. Forget the spoons now. Forget the spoon bending itself, the act of spoon bending. The real phenomenon, with me at least, is how... I instilled it into world culture. But then I realized that not everything is about show business. So I did a twist in my life. I started instilling motivational aspects in my shows. And then I realized that I was touching not hundreds of thousands of people, but millions of people, because I'm seen, being seen by a few millions of people every year on television. And then um, throughout the last, what, 35 years, um, Hannah, my wife and I, we would fly terminally ill children to England and I would motivate them to think positive. The spoon bending was entertainment. But you know what? The spoon bending was almost like a placebo effect for a sick child. Because if you said, see the spoon bending, it, they're so at awe, they're so surprised, that then I can slide into a motivational and positive talk, telling them to believe in themselves, 
telling them to continue working with their doctors, telling them to take their medicines that the doctors told them to take, and helping them throughout some very tough times because many of these kids have, you know, leukemia, uh, brain tumors, uh, and so on. So wherever I can, um, I help. My website is not a commercial website. As a matter of fact, anyone listening to us can read most of my books free of charge on my website, which is urigeller.com. Just click on free books and you can read them all. And wherever I can, um, like you, I'm sure Dr. J, you do the same. Johnny, you do charities. Um, hey, if we can help, I think we have to do that. That's right. I agree. And I've held several charity events over the last 15 years of uh, Toys for Tots, uh, you know, uh, you know, for Christmas, canned food drives for the homeless. Uh, and I want to say one good thing, uh, one great thing about you is the fact that you are a motivational speaker. And a lot of people mention Tony Robbins and mention you, but I want to put you on a step above that because Tony Robbins is still about money. His events, he charges one thousand dollars, one thousand dollars for the small, for the lowest ticket, up to twenty five thousand to be up front. Now, of course, I got a media pass to go in, and I realized this this guy is really he's telling it it's mo about motivation, but it's all about his money. You, on the other hand, you know, you're giving your books for free. You're bringing terminally ill children, you know, with your wife to England. So on that, you know, basis alone, that shows that you're pure of heart as opposed to uh, made yeah. of money. Thank you. That's really nice of you to say, but. There is a but here because you did mention Anthony Robbins and so on. Look. America is a democracy, it's an it's a enterprise. You know, some people think that the pavements are, you know, coated with gold. Uh, people came to America 150 years ago because they believe that it's an open country where anyone can make it. There's nothing, and let's, let's be very clear about this, there's nothing wrong in making money. Absolutely nothing wrong. If you can become a businessman or a businesswoman, if you can enhance your bank account, do it. There's nothing wrong with an, in making money. Now, if Anthony Robbins wants to charge a thousand dollars a ticket, and if you are a great Anthony Robbins fan and you pay that money, then you, you do. And so if Anthony Robbins, I don't know how much he earns a year, but if he makes 10, 20, 30, 40 million dollars a year, good for him. I don't think, I do not think that Anthony Robbins misleads people. I think that he's a great motivational individual. He started it. Uh, I take my hat off to him because he was the pioneer of motivational talks. And it's the same if you look at great magicians like David Copperfield and uh, Chris Angel. They're all multimillionaires. There is nothing wrong with that, uh, Dr. J. As long as within your organization, you also find time to help other people and charities. So you don't really know how much Anthony Robbins is giving away to sick children. I don't know either. So we cannot or you cannot um, say that I'm above Anthony Robbins because he's all about money. We don't know what he does every year. Maybe Anthony Robbins gives away millions to sick kids or to charities. So we don't know that. You, um, you're so, absolutely right. That yeah, is so true. I, never, I, I don't you, know that. No. So, Dr. J, I never thought of myself as above anyone. I always thought that, hey, if I earn good money, um, I feel it's almost a duty, it's a cosmic law. You know, it's like the law of attraction, which I'm sure you covered in many of yes. your radio shows. There's a law in the universe that if you're successful, you should give away a part of your money. And that's what Bill Gates is doing. Bill Gates gave billions away, he and his wife. But he's still one of the richest people in the world. And I believe that this cosmic law, the universal law, 
and we all know it, is if you are a good person and you give away part of your money to a good cause, you will be even wealthier and you will be happier and you might even be healthier if you adhere to that universal law. Always help other people if you can. So, yeah, that's what I said. So let's put that behind us. You actually took those words, what I was just going to say. You know, what I want for the world is, you know, to be healthiness and, and successful for everybody. You know, nobody deserves to live in poverty or does not have access to um, hospitals or what's needed. And you're right. I believe in that universal rule. Uh, everybody should give back. And that's why anybody who makes it to a level where they're able to support themselves should support whatever they can on whatever level. Now, I'm going to switch gears a little bit. One of our good friends and a guest that comes on uh, fairly often is Lieutenant Colonel Michael Aquino, uh, who also holds a PhD uh, political science, but that really doesn't matter with what he did. Lieutenant Colonel in the U.S. Army, and he taught at the U.S. Army School of Warfare, G the JFK School of Warfare PSYOPs Division. Recently, he wrote a manuscript called Mind War, and what it was intentions were was to end the killing by using mind war. And so what was circulating with the Pentagon and intelligence agencies, and I personally got it into some intelligence agencies. For instance, I'm a good friends with the former defense minister of, of Canada, Paul Hellyer, and another minister, or not the uh, ministry, actual minister, but an employee from the UK Ministry of Defense. And so we were able to get this. And so he ended up publishing it. And what it says is basically, uh, you know, I'm sure you know this exactly, what the eyes see and the ears hear, the mind believes. And what he basically says is if we can, can you know, control the five senses of people, you could, the same way you incite a riot to get people all riled up, or say as the CIA tortures people, you can use it the opposite way to make people calm and happy. And he actually, this sounds really bad to mention, Adolf Hitler, but at the same time, you know, prior to this, you know, a world domination and killing people, I mean, in my own family lost seven people to him. Uh, but the point is, before that, 1938 and, and before, the Nuremberg ceremonies, if you look at all the pomp and circumstance, with all the fires, the flags, the way he spoke, it was hypnotic to everybody. And that's how he got everybody to sort of, uh, I guess, you know, commend him and, and, you know, not they didn't give their their lives to Germany. They gave their lives to him, which I think was sort of wrong. But that was a bad example. My point is, I think we could do this globally. You know, we should we should be at getting to the point where we could unify the entire world and end this you know petty fighting that's been going on for thousands of years. Yeah, but um, Doctor J, we all know and. You must know it's even stronger because you're researching all the time and you have interesting guests that the wars that are being fought now are basically in the name of religion. Uh, all these wars that are raging around the world, sadly, um, people are fighting in the name of religion. And if you look back at the history of armies and wars, we're going back 10,000 years. You know, there were wars all the time. And instead of diminishing wars, we are sometimes experiencing the heightening of wars. And the reason is very simple. That our weaponry system is becoming more sophisticated and more sophisticated. So we can kill more people with one blow. Whether it's uh, with machine guns and... In, and Sadly, in the United States, the guns are everywhere. Uh, crazy people go out and shoot people, uh, students in campuses. In Israel, it's terrorism. Around the world, it's terrorism. And then we've got the big, big boys, the big weapons, nuclear weapons. There are thousands of nuclear weapons around the world, um, it, you know, being held by these big nations. Some of these weapons are mobile, some of them, these nuclear weapons are on airplanes, some of them are in submarines, some of them are actually moving trains in Russia. 
nuclear weapons aimed, listen to me, aimed at cities in the United States. It's just right. a matter of the press of the button, of the red button, and the missile goes up. Therefore, we are in the business of the arms race. Thousands and thousands and thousands of billions are spent uh, on arm race. Now, why am I bringing this? Because while we're spending so much money uh, on weapons of mass destruction, we are, instead of funneling and channeling that money into finally eradicating cancer and AIDS and other diseases, that the world still has plentiful of, we are y using it in sophistication of weapons that at the end of the day um, will kill other humans. Also, we are going through a very massive turmoil. It's, you know, life and history is like a roller coaster. We've got ups and downs. Do you realize, Dr. J and Johnny, that every three seconds, every three seconds, and let me count three seconds, 21, 22, 23, three seconds went by and a baby died from hunger somewhere around the world. If you don't spell this out to people, people don't realize this when they wake up in the morning, the 24 hours a day, every three seconds, a baby dies from hunger. Every 48 seconds, a, a, a child dies from malaria somewhere around the world. Can you imagine the, the enormity of this tragedy that this is still going on around the world? So instead of doing something to stop this from happening, like you said, hunger, and people have no, not only food, but no shelter, no clothing, people are struggling. The, the mass population on our planet, because I think we are now standing at about 7.2 billion people, I would say that 6.5 billion people are poor, are struggling worldwide. And that is what we have to solve. But it's not easy, because while all this is going on, there are these intricate, complex wars of religion that are going on in many, many parts of the world. And the reason the CIA, National Security, you know, NSA, National Security Agency, the reason they are taping this conversation now, they might be not, they might not be listening to my phone call, but they are taping it. You would be surprised that every time you go on air, NSA is taping you. They oh, might yeah. not be listening to you, but they're taping you for records to keep on forever and beyond. All our emails, all our SMSs, all the Facebooks, all the Twitters, all the Instagrams, all the Telegraphs, every way, possible way of communication today is listened into. Big brother is listening. Now, why did I bring this up? Because they're not really listening in order to evade or invade your privacy. They're listening because they're worried. The governments of the world are worried about one thing and one thing only. They're worried that terrorism is becoming so sophisticated that sooner or later a terrorist organization will be clever enough to build a nuclear weapon in a suitcase. And if the 11th of September, the World Trade Center buildings uh, were not enough, meaning not enough people died, enough people died on that tragic day. But in small nuclear suitcase bomb exploding downtown Manhattan or in Milano or Paris or London or Los Angeles, that's going to kill three, four hundred thousand people and radiate 
radioactivity in a circumference of miles and miles, you won't be able to get into that area for years. So that's what we are worried about. And I think, Dr. J, you will agree with me that I'm talking the truth. Very, very much so. And, and I actually fear several things. The disconnect. Uh, thousands of years ago, a war was fought with, say, a, a sword. So it was up close, personal. People would come back and would really have that, you know, the memories of, of you know, war, warfare. Nowadays, you have an 18-year-old kid fresh out of high school who goes to Nellis Air Force Range in Nevada flying a drone over, say, Pakistan, Iraq, wherever, dropping bombs like a video game, and he never sees what's actually happening. And when you brought up, you know, the, the children that are dying of hunger, that's the sad part. You know, we're, we're, they're showing, what do you show on the news every time you turn it on, in, in America especially? You, they, they don't show the real problems that humanity faces, and that's, you know, I think that disconnect is is a big problem in our society and you mentioned you know just in this little you know san fernando valley right here in in, in the los angeles city of angels or uh, you know some people are not so angelic but regardless the point being is there's two million people in a matter of 20 20 miles by 15 miles and then you know you expand it to you know greater los angeles you have 12 million people it just the destruction from one of those bombs could decimate everybody. And then, like you said, the radiation, the fallout is, is very sickening. So I really hope people can uh, – we can learn. That. And all we can do is educate. And, and that's why we ba basically started this show five years ago was to educate people on whatever we can and whatever uh, – experts, uh, expert topics or t uh, someone had is what we brought them on. So I'm glad you brought that up because it's a very good message that we need to uh, express to people. It's, it's something I really, really fear. With yeah. that being said, we are going to take a quick break. Everybody stay tuned. We got so much more with Uri Geller in just a few short minutes.
All right, welcome back to the second hour of Dr. J Radio Live. Of course, I am your host, Dr. J, co-hosting with me live in London, where it happens to be 4 a.m. Greenwich Mean Time, is, of course, Johnny Webb. And we are speaking to the one and only Uri Geller, where, of course, it is uh, it would be 6 a.m. Uh, in Israel time as, as we speak. Now, let me begin with this in this question. At the second hour, of course. You've done a lot of demonstrations, and we talked a lot about them in the first hour. What was the one demonstration that made you, uh, that was the world most famous, uh, that made, you know, that everybody talked about? Yeah, well, what happened is, Dr. J and Johnny, it was uh, one of my biggest shows were, was on the BBC with a man called David Dimbledy, who's still alive, but that show launched my other shows, and what I did was so weird or strange or bizarre, but it was the first actual real interactive demonstration uh, of things that would happen in people's homes. And I remember the host handed me a spoon, and for some strange reason, I looked into the camera and I said to everybody at home, go and get your spoons, go and get your broken watches because something might happen in your home. I didn't realize, Dr. J, that I sent 10 million people to the kitchen, but everyone went to the kitchen, they brought in a spoon, their keys, and, and broken watches. And I'll tell you what we, we should do. Let's recreate that um, television show. Also, I've done it on radio shows many, many times with great success. So what I'll be asking you right now, all your listeners, wherever you are around the world, I want you to go right now and get broken watches, broken clocks, gather them up together and come back to the radio set and continue listening to our show, to Dr. J. Also bring a spoon along and let's give you five minutes to do that. Even if you have uh, broken pocket watches, that are over 60, 70, 80, 100 years old. Um, if you have uh, old wristwatches, uh, alarm watches, uh, bring them to the radio set and bring also a spoon and a bunch of keys. When we, um, we won't go out into a commercial now. We'll continue, I'll, I'll continue talking with Dr. J and Johnny. But in about five minutes from now, once you have gathered all that, all the broken watches, spoons, bunches of keys. I will do an experiment with all of you, and then we will see what will happen. Okay, go 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 ahead now and go and get your uh, stuff that I've asked for, and uh, we'll reconnect in five minutes. But right now, I'll continue talking with Dr. J about other things. Exactly. Everybody, I urge you to please go out there and grab the items that Uri suggested. Uh, in fact, I'm going to go grab my own watch while we're doing this myself. And everybody, like he said, a spoon. And, you know, in five minutes, of course, you know, we all want you to be part of this global experiment. And I cannot wait for your feedback as you always give us, you know, and it's fantastic. Let's go back to this year, the, the 80s, I think it was. For a time, you sort of dropped out and you started using your senses. And I thought this was really fantastic. You were flying over fields. I don't know if it was in England. And you were able to sense where there was gold and oil. Yes. It, it started, Dr. J, by, uh, I mentioned to you that uh, very famous uh, BBC with David Dimbleby. Um, unknown to me, uh, one of the most, uh, the biggest or uh, the most famous mining companies in England is called Rio Tinto Zinc. It was called Rio Tinto Zinc then. I believe now it's called Rio Tinto. That's a multi-billion uh, dollar company. And they're in the business of looking for oil and mines and, and so forth. Uh, the chairman of the board of that company was at that time Sir Val Duncan. Sir Val Duncan was also, at one point, the chairman of the Bank of England. But he was also a secret dowser. And when he saw me on television bending a spoon or a fork, he immediately 
traced me down the next day after my TV show and invited me over to his house. I, of, of course, I was um, kind of amazed that such an important uh, person, figure, would invite me over to his house in London. And he very calmly told me, look, Roy, I've seen your show, you're amazing, but let me tell you something, there is more money in finding metal than bending metal. And I said, what do you mean? And then he told me about his dousing abilities, that he can locate water with, twi with twigs, wooden twigs, branches. And then he said, will you come with me to Mallorca, where I have a, my private home, I uh, will fly you there with a, a private jet of Rio Tinto, which blew my mind because it was the first time I ever uh, flew a private jet. And uh, on the island of Mallorca, he buried some little cans of oil, and I found them. I doused with my hands. I didn't use any twigs. And he was quite astonished, and then he take, picked up the phone, and he, he got me... Uh, he introduced me to some mining companies, and the rest was history. Uh, one of my biggest finds was in Mexico. It was for the national oil company called Pemex, and uh, the president of Mexico at that time was called uh, Lopez Portillo, and uh, Lopez Portillo arranged me to meet the oil minister, and they flew me over with the helicopter over the Gulf of Mexico. I had the map uh, laid on my, uh, in my lap, and I had a marker, and when I felt something, the twingling feeling, I put an X on the map, and believe it or not, a year and a half from that moment, they found oil exactly under that place in the Gulf of Mexico that I put an X on the map. That obviously impressed, uh, the president, and he honored me by making me a Mexican citizen. And he gave, a, and I got a Mexican passport. So, there, you know, then I started doing this. Uh, and, uh, of course, money went to my head. I was on an ego trip. I was only after fame and fortune. It was a terrible time in my life. I became bulimic. Uh, I could afford anything and everything. And uh, it was actually it was John Lennon who directed me to Japan to find spirituality. And really? And yeah, and peace of mind. And I took my family, myself, Hannah, my wife, my mother, my brother-in-law, my two children, Daniel and Natalie. We uh, took off. We landed in Narita Airport. I hired a van. We drove straight to Mount Fuji. And we drove straight into a forest under Mount Fuji, and we disappeared from civilization, and we lived in a tiny hut in the middle of the forest under Mount Fuji. But when you were emerged, you were still as famous as ever. Yes. Uh, you know, you were on every show that I could think of. I've seen so many magazine covers that you were on. I mean, that's why I'm yep. just... We've had so many guests on this show, uh, uh, you know, politicians, uh, astronauts like Edgar Mitchell, uh, you name it, uh, experts in different fields. Uh, uh, the list is enormous. There's been over 500 plus shows that we've had, and that's why I am very honored to have you on the show uh, because of literally of uh, so many accomplishments that you've had. Uh, it's, see, I thought it was the 70s, but really going back to 65, you know, right before the Six-Day War. Uh, now, I think it's been about four minutes. Do you want to try the experiment? Yes, I will try it. I just want to finish uh, my sentence that when we sure. uh, went into the forest in Japan, we totally, I totally changed. Uh, I learned about spirituality, meditation, running around the lakes, Lake Yamanakako, uh, eating uh, vegetarian food. It was amazing. And we came back into civilization because my kids had to go to school. And otherwise, I, I guess we'd still be living in the forest on <laughs> the Mount Fuji. Now, the experiment. Listen to me very intently and carefully, everybody at home. Now that you've gathered your broken watches and pocket watches and broken alarm clocks, I want you to wind them up. Although they're broken, wind them up. And if you have a spoon, place it on the 
uh, computer that you're listening uh, to the show through or on the radio, whatever, wherever the, my voice comes out from, put the spoon over on, on it. Now, um, once you wound the watches up, I want you to now place uh, the watch or some watches that are not working in your hands and, and close your fist over the watches. And listen to me, over the coming uh, minute and a half to two minutes might sound to you weird and, and certainly it's bizarre, uh, even slightly funny. I'm going to ask you all to shout out with me, including Dr. J and Johnny in England, the, the word work. We'll do, we'll do it a few times. I'm going to say one, two, three, and you'll shout out the word work. And you people at home too, you'll shout out the word work. And one, uh, when you do that, I truly want you to believe that your mind power can activate your broken watches. And um, I'll tell you, just follow my instructions. Now, don't be alarmed if the spoon jumps off the radio, off the television, or your lights will flicker, or something weird might happen in your living room. Uh, if you're driving cars and you have something broken in your car, focus on whatever is broken, but don't take your eyes off the road. And uh, let's do the experiment now. So here we go. When I say one, two, three, a few times we'll do it. I want you all to shout out the word work. Are you all ready? Everybody at home, everyone around the world, wherever you are, here we go. Dr. J, get ready. Johnny, get ready. Yeah. One, two, three, work. Work. Again. One, two, three, work. Work. One more time. One, two, three, work. Yeah. Work. And everybody at home, one last time, shout it out loudly. One, two, three, work. 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 Now listen to me carefully. No matter how funny this experiment looks, I now want you to open your hands and look at your watches, at your clocks, at your alarm watches, at your pocket watches. If you have a second hand, is it moving? Did it start? If you do not have a second hand, lift the broken watch to your ear and listen carefully. Can you hear it ticking? Did your watch, did your alarm clock, did your wristwatch, did your pocket watch, did it start working? Did a spoon move? Check the set of keys. Is one key bent, even slightly, and that you're sure that it wasn't bent before? My key is bent. Now, wait, wait, hold on. Hold on, Dr. J. If nothing happened to you, don't be disappointed, because this doesn't happen to everyone. It doesn't happen all the time. But if you what started ticking, if your key bent slightly, if something weird happened in your room, if the key moved, if your, if your spoon bent, if it moved, if it jumped, if it fell off, please let us know if something indeed happened to you. Now, Dr. J, what do you usually give out for your listeners to contact you? Of course, everybody goes to drjradiolive.com and use the contact page. So I encourage everybody out there who's been part of this experiment, please contact me. I want to hear what you have to say about what you experienced because I can tell you what I just saw and I am blown away. What and, happened and to you, Dr. J? I, I, what, my keys bent. That, that, I've never seen that before happen in my life because they're obviously straight. This is my car key. Literally, it is bent. Yeah, now, by the way, when I do these shows, I always have a hammer with me because when I'm on stage, I can hammer the keys out. <laughs> but if, if your key bent, you know, no big deal. You just put it, you know, knock it with a hammer, it'll, it'll go back to its original position. But I would keep the key bent if you have a spare key because it's really a, a test, testimony to the power of your mind. Now, um, many, many years, uh, Dr. J, I thought that I was doing it. I thought that some so sort of energy uh, is being emitted from my mind into your homes, into the keys, into the watches, and making your watches come alive. 
But I was, I was wrong. And I, I discovered that in Los Angeles. I was, um, I had a lecture at UCLA. And the professor that, uh, booked me was Dr. Selma Moss. She was quite well known. And Dr. Selma Moss, um, made me, um, this show. She, I was lecturing for students. They brought broken watches. I fixed the broken watches. And then she sent me back to New York. Now, what I didn't know is that Dr. Selma Moss, if you Google Dr. Selma Moss, you, you know who she was. Quite a very well-known, very well-respected, very prestigious professor. I didn't know that she secretly filmed me. And when I went back to New York, two weeks later, she invited a new set of students with more broken watches. But this time, I wasn't there. But the video really? was, the video was, because she secretly filmed me. And she played the video, my video, of two weeks ago to those students. And lo and behold, their broken watches started ticking from the video. So she calls me up in New York and she tells me, Uri, you just fixed broken watches in UCLA in Los Angeles. And I said to her, what are you talking about? I'm in New York. I didn't even know that you were doing an experiment. I wasn't even thinking. You're, you're kidding me. She says, no, I'm not. I just played your video that I did off your secret filming two weeks ago, and you just activated broken watches. And I then realized, it dawned on me, it dawned on me, that I was really only acting as a trigger I was a catalyst. I was only an enabler to the powers of the mind of those students who brought broken watches. And they did it. So you people at home, if that experiment worked that we did a few minutes ago, it was you who did it. Let us know what happened. So do the contact, Dr. J. And let us know. And promise me one thing, Dr. J, that you let me know if you got some response. Will you? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And let me say this uh, uh, on, on this topic. Because George Norrie told me when he did a rebroadcast of the same thing, people called in after to say that their watches were working. A rebroadcast, which exactly proves what you just said when you were filmed and it was played again later. And I, I was blown away. I was truly blown away. I will never forget that conversation that I had with them. And if I'm not mistaken, I think he even said that on air. Yeah, because it just shows you and proves everyone that it's really a motivational aspect. It's an empowerment. The power of the mind of human beings is enormous. You know, some say that we only use 10% of our brain. Maybe I use another half a percent. And you know, a few years from now, maybe 200 years from now, it will be a child play. Everybody will be bending. Everybody will be doing telepathy. I'm talking about just 50, 100, 200, 300 years from now. Can you imagine what's going to happen to humanity 2,000 years from now. You know, relatively, humanity is very young. Are we, what, 250,000 years old, 300,000 years old? That's all. If you come to think of it, if you go back to the Stone Age and apes, and, um, you know, I, I'm a great believer that we come from stars. I don't quite buy into Darwin's um, theory that we crawled out of the muck and out of amphibians we became, uh, you know, uh, monkeys and from there we evolved into humans. I want to uh, believe that a spacecraft landed or crashed and we are alien beings. We are actually extraterrestrials in nature. We are star children. I mean, that's my, my theory. But um, having said that, I think that we will all be telepathic. We'll all be, be able to teleport 
uh, 20,000 years from now, there will be no more airplanes, there are no ships, there will be no cars. We will be able to walk into a time machine, press button, and choose the city you want to dematerialize into. So you will dematerialize and you will materialize uh, in Australia from America or you will materialize on the moon where they will have colonies. Or you'll, you'll probably have colonies on Mars and we will have to because we'll have to find new source of energy. We'll have to find new source of food and we'll have to colonize uh, space. And that's what we're in, in the, that, the, the space race is all about that. But what a lot of people are missing is this simple sentence that the last frontier is not space. The last frontier is our mind. I'm actually really glad you brought that up for several reasons. Uh, first of all, the ancient alien theory, Eric Von Donneken's been on the show several times. We talked about the fact that uh, we were created, not that we evolved from apes. A lot of people, going back to the extraterrestrials that we were talking about early on in the show in the first half, uh, that some people say they levitate, go through walls. Now, it, the movie Lucy does a very good portrayal that shows that if we enhance the power of our brain, so like you said, you, you know, you possibly are using more than uh, other people, and other people who have telekinesis and other abilities like you are also accessing more. I believe that not only are we going to have tele telepathy, but I don't think we were born or meant to speak with our tongues. We should be speaking with our minds and hence should be speaking to or communicating with every animal on this planet. And of course, every animal out there. And, uh, yeah, and, and just to add to that, Dr. J, that this is why the human figure the human uh, the, the human uh, face, the human mind is evolving, which means that maybe a hundred thousand years from now or two hundred and fifty thousand years from now we won't look the same. We our minds will be bigger. We will lose maybe our mouth because what you just said, we will not be communicating verbally. We will not be using our vocal cords. We will be using and communicating telepathically, mind to mind. Maybe even vision-wise, we will be looking into space through our mind. We will be transporting our bodies through space and time, which means that we, our physical look will change. It's really quite phenomenal and amazing. But that is what what is happening even now. So, hey, who knows? Maybe the aliens that many people have been reporting uh, as, hey, we've seen aliens and they look like greys. They have big heads, large eyes, small mouths, etc., uh, etc., et Maybe that's what we are evolving into. It's just so fascinating because, you see, Dr. J, there is no time. Maybe reality and quantum physics, quantum mechanics, quantum entanglement is being created all the time, non-stop right now. So is it possible, Dr. J, that you are now? simply creating Uri Geller and I'm creating you. Maybe there is pure consciousness and nothing exists. Maybe there is one big vacuum out there and there's just pure, pure energy, pure consciousness and just our consciousness is creating Dr. J. It is so complex. It is so difficult to understand and it all boils down to one word and one word only. And the word is infinity, which means no end. There no is end. no end to the universe. There is no end to outer space. And there is no end to inner space. 
You should travel into inner space, into uh, the tip of your pen, into the ball, the rolling ball of your biro, of your pen. You will discover universes. And inside those universes, there will be more universes. There will be cosmoses. And that never ends. And the same with outer space. So it is amazing. And um, we can only use our imagination today to fathom, to imagine, to fantasize those things that to us today seem science fiction. But there's no science fiction. All the science fiction movies and all the science fiction books that you read and watch today are reality. It's going to happen sooner or later. What say you, Dr. J? Science fiction comes from fact. I, I believe that we, first of all, two things I want to say. Quantum mechanics. I'm, I'm glad you brought that up for, for a couple of reasons. First of all, Edgar Mitchell. 44 years ago, on his way home from the moon, has a fantastic moment where he sees the moon, the sun, and the earth in, in this one single, uh, you know, image, because he's obviously in a spacecraft. So he founded, uh, <clears throat> I don't know the name of the organization that is studying quantum mechanics, but uh, consciousness, and studying consciousness. And going back to the in infinity, uh, obviously, with within quantum mechanics, they're talking about the, the Big Bang is continuing to happen even now as we speak, Uri. It's been happening nonstop from the beginning of the show to now, and it's going to continue forever, and it's always happened in the past. So therefore, there's never been a beginning because it always was and always will be. And then going back to imagination. Now, it, so so you have science fiction. People say, Oh, you got UFOs because of Hollywood. It's the other way around. What are minds' uh, dreams? So, for instance, uh, 2,000 years ago, you you think of, uh, you see birds flying. So then you start having dreams of maybe flying, right? And then, of course, you know, that it, it turns into Hollywood. So everything that is science fiction has some basis in fact. Because if people wouldn't have imagined it, then therefore they couldn't create it. And, and that's why I believe that there's always a, a sense of reality to all of the science fiction. And, and, and one day, you know, I don't know if it's going to be a hundred years or a hundred thousand years that people will finally realize this because a lot of people are finally jumping on the wagon and acknowledging this. And I think it's very important because there is, you know, a time is something man created. And I'm glad you brought that up again. That's the third thing I wanted to acknowledge, that that is something that humanity, humankind, we yeah. created that. I, I, and it it I, never ended. Yeah, I agree with you 100%. By the way, the uh, organization that Edward Mitchell created was called Noetic Signs. Yes. Out of right. um, uh, San Francisco uh, with Brendan O'Regan, who was, was a British uh, man who I, I believe was uh, at some stage, maybe MI6 or MI5. But what's um, interesting also uh, with uh, Edgar Mitchell um, and what you're saying, what you're bringing in consciousness, is let's for a moment talk about spirituality. You know that in 1924, a very clever man, a very clever scientist, came up with a, an amazing scientific equation. And the equation is what we learned in school. It's E equals MC square. Of course, it was Albert Einstein. Einstein. Yes. And Albert Einstein, with that equation, E equals MC square, he um, proved to the world to the scientific world that everything in the universe is made from energy. But what is further proved is very spiritual, that energy cannot be destroyed. Uh, so the table that I'm sitting at and talking to you, and I'm going to knock the phone on the table for a moment, to you it sounds and feels solid. To us the table is solid. But actually, the table is not solid. It is made from pure energy. It's only vibrating in a certain frequency that to us feels solid. 
So Albert Einstein continued to prove that energy cannot be destroyed. Therefore, one must ask the question, well, if energy cannot be destroyed, what happens to us when we die? What happens to our body if it cannot be destroyed because it's energy, it's made from energy? What happens to our soul? What happens to our spirit? That's why I'm such a great believer, and I was always, since childhood, that there is no death. Uh, there is a transition into uh, a new dimension, another dimension, another arena, uh, somewhere out there, heaven, uh, call it paradise, call it whatever you want to call it. But I do not believe that you totally die, your energy survives your body, and you continue on living in a different dimension. It's funny about that. Fight, fight. Johnny, go ahead, because I was going to talk about Nassim Harriman and consciousness. I always knew that there are vibrations and energy, but it wasn't until Nassim Harriman explained to me the string theory that within uh, going to subatomic levels is strings, and these strings can elongate or shrink or even uh, circle around, connect, and, and have endless uh you know, combinations or, or shapes, and therefore each of these strings sends a vibration. And that is what you said, just is what's causing everything, cause and effect of everything, and material. And it, within uh, the table, within uh, the studio, within a room, or anything, a wall, it's, there's so much space between molecules and, and atoms it's unbelievable to think yeah, well, about. I just that's what we we uh, talked about inner space. That to us the uh, and and I get again I bring in. Let's talk about just one molecule. If you enter that one molecule, if you had a spaceship that could go into inner space, and you travel through that molecule, <laughs> you will find another molecule and another one, and suddenly you will be sailing through. Uh, inner space and suddenly it will be as vast as our universe and bigger than that. It's just so astounding and so fascinating and at times so astonishing how little we know. I mean, you know, let me ask you one very silly, uh, childish and trivial question which most people can't really answer. And it just shows you how little we know. And the question is, what came first, the chicken or the egg? You can't be sure. Neither can I. Can you imagine that we don't know the answer to such a simple question? Am I right? You are absolutely right. It's funny, though. I, I have an answer for that particular question. And, and it's a, imagine a picture of a chicken and, uh, and uh, just an egg. And the egg is facing away from the chicken. And the chicken's sitting there smoking a cigarette. And I think he's saying, I know who came first, because he's smiling. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's funny, but um, yes, we are constantly exploring, uh, and we've got this space mission, and in a few years from now, um, I'll be able to fly from Israel to New York in uh, one hour, and uh, we're advancing... With your brain! With your brain, well, right? That would, that's that's, that's not a year from now. That will take oh, take, okay, take okay. a while. That's I'm talking about uh, supersonic and uh, flying in speeds that we cannot imagine today. Uh, but that's just like two or three or four or five years from now. But again, thousands of years from now, uh, hopefully, will still exist because, hey, we haven't spoken about uh, Mother Nature, which... Uh, is such a tremendous force that if Mother Nature gets fed up with us polluting our planet, um, there will be natural catastrophes. You know, look what that last tsunami did in uh, Japan. Uh, look at these disaster movies uh, where you see uh, 400 meter high waves sweeping over New York. Uh, we have these uh, 8.7 megahertz or what is it called, um, seismo, seismologically uh, measured 8.9 on the Richter scale 
earthquakes. Uh, everyone is waiting for that one big one in San Francisco, California. Some people even believe that California is going to drop into the ocean. Uh, some people believe that New York is going to go under the water. So Mother Nature is very, very powerful. And we are really in the clutches of my Mother Nature. So we really have to think of new energy sources, less pollution. Uh, we don't want the ice caps uh, melting, but sadly they are. I think the oceans are getting higher, like is it half a meter or by a meter every year? It, it's just catastrophic what is going on. And uh, you, you know that, Johnny. I mean, how many uh, beautiful cliffs in England are falling to the ocean? How many houses have to be ab abandoned that 50 years ago or 80 years ago were built on the ocean lines that are crumbling away, that are eroding away? Right, Johnny? T tell us what's happening in England. Well, you know, to be honest with you, I do. I live in central London, but but my brothers and friends they do live on the coast, and when I do go down there, you know, you do see that land is shrinking, um, especially on the cliff edges. And and as you say, you know, there's lovely properties that have been built up over the years on these on these edges, but they're falling into the oceans, just like you see in in the west coast of California. You know, I was just gonna say here in California, uh, Malibu, you have homes uh, that are literally. You know, they used to have maybe a hundred feet, maybe twenty feet, depending on where along the coast, that have receded so much that the homes are are collapsing. Santa Barbara, for instance, State Street in Ala Vista is it's a very popular college town where University of California Santa Barbara is. Those apartments it is a very valuable property, by the way. Those apartments are literally are going to be uh, red flagged and are going to have to be demolished because if you see what's happening to them, the the receding shoreline, literally what used to be, you could walk on the off your balcony and you're on the beach. But now you have these wooden balconies where it's the water's right underneath it. And, and it's, it's a scary thing because we're talking about it, but it's a reality. And Mother Nature... The, the concept of Mother Nature uh, being alive, Earth is a living being, Gaia, and the earthquakes, they are definitely increasing. That is a fact. Uh, I remember there, you know, the, what they were talking about in recent uh, modern history, and when I mean modern, 20th century, not, you know, 20,000 years ago, the biggest quake was the San Francisco quake. But now in the last 12 years, since 2004, the nine point what was it two the Sumatra quake that killed two hundred fifty thousand people. Then you had another nine point oh or eight point nine in Chile. I, I mean, it's it's saddening and amazing, but it, you know you have to recognize that, like you said, if we don't respect Mother Earth, then it will take us out because yep. we yep. are just small inhabitants. Uh, absolutely, and you said the, the word, it's reality. We're speaking about it. It's a great radio show. You have lots of listeners, but we become blasé to certain dangerous aspects that are uh, kind of uh, coming upon us and beginning to uh, suffocate us. If you look at it that way, it's so serious how these water lines uh, uh, and, and land is receding into the oceans and the oceans are, are going higher and higher. It is really scary. And uh, today, because we've got all the Internet and the Googles, you can look at uh, Google Maps that or, and, and older maps that were taken from pictures of satellites and airplanes. It is scary to see how much land has disappeared, how many front shore uh, key, sh you know, uh, from sea shores and lakes and rivers have gone, went under the water. It is just, uh, yeah, it is scary and shocking and very, very worrisome. Uh, then you've got, like you said, the earthquakes and earthquakes create tsunamis. And let's face it, if a tsunami hits Los Angeles, um, my God, that is going to be a, a devastation. 
So we've got to find ways, we've got to find solutions for these major, mega, mega problems that we're facing. And uh, I have to bring in Mother Nature because we're talking about the arms race, we're talking about diseases, we're talking about consciousness, we're talking about universe. So I, you know, I'm, I wouldn't be surprised if we would simply have to someday just take off because by then we will have the right vehicles to travel the universe, to land on different planets, and to colonize there, colonize there, and create um, life on on uh, other planets, other stars, to continue the human race. And I think we all agree, all your listeners will agree to this, and if anyone thinks that I'm talking BS, and this is all science fiction, then I must tell you, wake up uh, to reality. It's a great reality check for you, but it is happening. Exactly. Well, I, I know that, you know, talking about the stars, there, there was one very famous star that was grounded here on Earth, Michael Jackson, and, and maybe not a lot of people know this, but you were his best man. Can you tell us what was it like that day, being uh, such a famous person as Michael Jackson and having the entourage that he must have had. What was that wedding like for you, and, and, and how did your best man's speech go? Michael Jackson was a great guy. Big tragedy that he died the way he died. Very, uh, yes, very Yes, he sad. was my best man uh, with Hannah when I renewed my wedding vows. And uh, very few people know this, but I had partly designed his last album. His last album, sadly... Uh, last album, of course, uh, was, was, is called Invincible. If you go out and buy Invincible and you open the booklet, you will find my drawing in Michael's, um, last CD. Michael was a very special man. Uh, he, he was and he's a legend. He was an icon. He was a phenomenon. And let me tell you a story that no one really knows. Michael wanted to travel to space. He actually wanted to do his moonwalk on the moon. And he told me one day, Uri, Uri, can you really help me? I I, I think it was one of the uh, Backstreet Boys or NSYNC. One, one of the boy bands um, uh, was in the news that he was going to travel to space. So Michael left me a message on my answering service machine. And he said, oh, Uri, Uri, please, please, please. Uh, I want to go, I want to be the first on the moon. Now, obviously, I smiled when I heard the message. Uh, of course, the first instant was, you know, he's such a child at heart. But then I started thinking. And I contacted a very serious scientist at um, the um, aircraft industry in um, uh, Boeing. And believe it or not, he was a, he is a very precise scientist. I won't mention his name, but we started communicating and we started talking about how do we put Michael Jackson on the moon? And believe it or not, and this is the truth, he calculated that with enough money, ten billion dollars, and if Michael is and was healthy enough to go through the strenuous test and, uh, you know, to, uh, he had to do, you know, there's a massive thing of training you to, to get into space and uh, to yeah, work in the moon. Yeah, you got to face all the Gs. It, it was you know, a 10 year, it was a, it would, he calculated out that it's a 10 year project. And he also told me that money wouldn't be a problem because any big company like Coca Cola or General Electric or Facebook, who wouldn't want to see their logo on the shoulder or on the on, on Michael Jackson's space jacket. And they would have funded billions to get Michael Jackson on the moon. So it was so feasible. It sounded so real. I still have all those emails from the scientist who was a big shot at uh, Boeing. And um, he worked at space agencies in Florida that it looked so so real that it could come true and then came suddenly unfortunately sadly that infamous uh interview with martin bashir oh yeah and that yes. started it all his downfall you know the 
child abuse um, accusation, etc., etc., and it all fell apart. But that's something that I don't really talk about this space thing because it was so unbelievable. But since you brought it up, you've got the scoop. I feel so bad for his family. I happened to live in Santa Barbara and be there when they his, lane, his plane landed. I was actually eating at the Elephant Bar right by the airport, and I could see through the gates all the you know t- reporters, it's his, you know standing outside his hangar waiting for him to come out. Uh, very unfortunate. Very unfortunate. Uh, Yuri, uh, Yuri, we have about fifteen minutes left. So I want to get to a few more topics before. I want to get you some messages, of course, that I want you uh, to, to give to the listeners and, of course, the children of the future and talk about your family. Now, publicity, something we talked about in the beginning. There have been some people that have tried to debunk you but have ruined themselves, in fact. One of them, James Randi, what did he try to do? He wrote a book. What did it do? Nothing. It just made you that much more famous. It brought you that many more people to, you know, look into you, believe in you, put you on more covers on magazines, give you more, uh, you know, it was, it was a good thing. And yet he was trying to ruin you. And that's what I found so ironic. And, and so, uh, you know, well, let, let, me, let me a, a bit expand on that. Yes, James Randi, throughout my career, tried to debunk me, but uh, he failed miserably because I'm still around and I, That's right. I still have these huge TV shows. I still write my books. Uh, I still, um, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm boasting a little now, but I'm recognized in every country around the world. Controversy was a gift for me on a silver plate, and Randi instigated it. It was amazing how what... what um, free publicity he gave me. If I had to numeralize or quantify the free PR James Randi gave me, it would have to be between two and five million dollars of free publicity. He, James Randi was my best publicist. I owe him a thousand bouquets of flowers and some great um, bottles of wine because he was my chief unpaid publicist. That's right, so, that's right. And I'll never forget the day I learned how valuable uh, publicity is. I was asked to do the Johnny Carson show. So Johnny Carson invites me. And everybody told me, wow, if you get on the Johnny Carson, you made it in America. So I got on the show, and I didn't realize that I walked into a trap. Uh, Johnny called Randy, and they set me up. And um, I sat there for 22 minutes humiliated. I was sweating because Johnny Carson was uh, cynical, skeptical, and the spoon I bent, I did bend the spoon in the hands of Ricardo Monteblon, if you remember uh, the great um, actor. But yes. J- Johnny Carson said, oh, it's not bent enough. Anyhow, I thought that I'm destroyed. And after the show, I went back to my hotel. I was so gutted, like that's a British word. I was so stressed out and demoralized that I fell on the bed and fell asleep. And I had only one thought in my mind. Wake up next morning, pack up, and fly back to Israel. Because I thought that show destroyed me. The next but but morning, it didn't. Well, listen, didn't. The next morning... The phone rings in my little hotel in Los Angeles, and the operator tells me, Mr. Geller, I have a Merv Griffin on the line for you. <laughs> so I nice. jumped up, and I said, you mean the Merv Griffin? And she said, yeah, he says he is Merv Griffin. So I get on the line, and lo and behold, he is Merv Griffin, and he says to me, Uri Geller, I saw you last night on Johnny Carson. I want you on my show this week. That's when I realized. That's when it dawned on me that all publicity is good publicity. So from that moment, I didn't read anything about the regular. I measured it. I had a little tape that I used to carry with me. And whenever there was an article, good or bad, I pulled out the ruler 
and I said, wow, 12 inches long, that's amazing. Because I, I knew that a full page ad in Time Magazine or in the New York Times costs 30, 40, 50,000 dollars. And I was At getting least, it free. Yeah. So the, right. the, the skeptics failed miserably. And, um, like you said, you're clever. They gave me more publicity, uh, that actually also mystified me. People who are controversial are interesting. People who are controversial, they are causing curiosity about themselves. And again, look at Donald Trump. He's, um, you know, controversial. So people love it. People want to know about him. People want to read about him. People want to hear him talk. And that's what skeptics did for me. And that's all we will say about skeptics because they're not worth talking about. You're right. Let me say one more, which I think I failed miserably. But yet, uh, there's a video online that actually proves you were correct. And that was Chris Angel on the Supernatural Show. When he asked you to read what was in the envelope. Yet, this video online actually takes the numbers you gave and adds them up to 9-11. Did you absolutely, see that video? Absolutely. Absolutely. By the way, that was my show. Um, I created a show 10 years ago called Phenomenon. In many countries, it was called the next Uri Geller. In some countries, the new Uri Geller. And I got Chris Angel to be my co-host. Um, and I do respect Chris Angel because he's amazing. He's Anyone who can do over a thousand TV shows must be an amazing guy. And he is an amazing guy. But on that show, when we, we pushed that envelope without me knowing that I'm going to be tested, I didn't really know how to put those numbers together, so I started to utter the words uh, that uh, summed up the numbers of 9-11. And uh, he said that he'll give me a million dollars if I get the right number. Um, I still haven't been paid, but, but that's okay, because maybe I didn't come up with exactly those numbers. But, I, I you know, with, no matter what you say about Chris Angel, um, he's a fine guy, very talented, very skilled. He's a brilliant magician, call him, call him a brilliant mentalist, and uh, he has a great show. So anyone who will uh, try to say negative words or debunk Chris Angel is totally and utterly either jealous of him or envious of him because he's great. I mean, he's one of the greatest magicians uh, in the world because of his fame and because he's done so many TV shows, the same with David Copperfield. I respect these guys because of the achievements they managed to create with their persona, with their personality, with their character, and with their charisma. A couple more things, and you're right. And again, there's that video that says your it adds up your numbers, and it shows that you were absolutely correct. That's what I find to be the most important. I think that is super Thank you. important. Now, a couple more things. You mentioned your children. I I heard or read somewhere one of your uh, is it your son that lives in Los Angeles and is a lawyer. Uh, let me tell you about my son and then my daughter. My daughter, Natalie, she lives in Los Angeles, and she just made up uh, grandparents. Uh, she gave birth to a beautiful uh, baby girl called Romy. She's married to Ehud, Ehud uh, Caldus, who is a brilliant magician. Um, musician. Uh, he's actually a magician in music because he writes music, he creates music, and I, uh, I see a great future for Ehud. Uh, they love America. They live in, uh, you know, again in Beverly Hills. And they're both very happy. And of course now with the baby, Romy, you can imagine they're over the moon. So that's with Natalie and Ehud and Romy. My son, Daniel, Daniel, both kids were born in America. And Daniel, um, uh, came, uh, you know, we went to live in uh, England in 1983. So 
Daniel and Natalie grew up in England. They yeah, went to I local. Think that you, you live in in um, Shoning, in near the River Thames, very yes. nice place in Berkshire. I live, yeah, and that's where funny George Clooney bought a house too. Yeah, yeah. And Jimmy Page, Jimmy Page lives there uh, from Led Zeppelin and Home Secretary and so on. But Daniel finished uh, uh, schooling in England. Then he went to LSE, London School of Economics. Then he went to law school. He became a barrister, a criminal barrister in England. Then he decided that he wants to be an American lawyer, so he went to California and he finished. Uh, that's the most difficult bar to finish. Uh, I I know because I've taken it. <laughs> you know, so that's, you, that's, that's why I brought it up. Yeah, so you know. Yeah. So he finished. He's an American lawyer too. Then he wanted to become a New York lawyer, so he went to New York and he became a New York lawyer. And then he went back to America to England. And now he works, uh, you know, he's a, 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 a prosecutor at the, in the Crown Prosecution Service in England, uh, which is, uh, you know, Johnny uh, will be able to tell you more about that. And um, they are brilliant children. Daniel was very intuitive when he was a young boy. He could uh, do a lot of very interesting feats with his mind. And they're extremely happy. They come to visit me in, in Israel. Uh, about four months ago, we decided to uh, come back to our homeland. After 46 years, uh, Dr. J, of living uh, out of the borders of Israel, we you now live... In Jaffa, yeah? Yeah, we live in old Jaffa. Uh, if you Google old Jaffa and you click on images, you will see what an amazing 6,000-year-old place this is. And I know that we are coming to the end of the show, so I want to invite again everybody to my website, which is www.urigeller.com, and Uri Geller is spelled U-R-I-G-E-L-L-E-R.com. All my books are free of charge. Uh, there is a very interesting movie uh, by an Oscar-winning director online on my homepage, front page, called The Secret Life of Uri Geller, and there's another film by Simon Cowell, called Uri Geller, A Life Stranger Than Fiction. I think if you watch those two movies, uh, you will be quite amazed at what I went through in the last 55 years of my life. I, you know, it's been an honest pleasure to have, have you on the show. I know fans are definitely going to uh, appreciate this and already have appreciated you. I, You know, I've... A tremendous uh, appreciation for you for for years for years and it's been an honor to speak to you so i have one more thing i want to ask you and if you could just hang on for one second after that if you have one message for all the listeners out there for all the children of the future what would you say to them this is my message i get 300 emails a day because my email is on my website many of them are from children from teenagers who want to learn how to bend the spoon and this is what I answer to any child who wants to learn how to bend a spoon. Children, anyone listen to me who are kids now and teenagers, this is my message. Forget spoon bending. Instead, become a positive thinker, believe in yourself, focus on school, create a target goal, to go to university. Never ever smoke. Never ever touch drugs. And always think of success. Well said, Uri Geller. Can you believe that? Listen, he wants feedback from all you. All you have to do is go to my website, drjradiolive.com. That's the name of the show, drjradiolive.com. And hit, of course, the contact button and to put the title Uri Geller Feedback. Now, like he said during the experiment, uh, there will be some people who it won't happen to, others that it will. I want to hear from those who it did happen to. And I will personally direct them to Mr. Geller myself. 
And of course, like he said, make sure you check out his site. I do want to give some shout outs to, of course, now, as you heard, uh, Mike Vara just finished before this. We want to thank you all people in the late night in the Midlands land for listening to us. We are going to be broadcasting Tuesday through Thursday. I also want to thank Ira Robinson, who's done a lot of work getting this set up. And of course, the two of them work really hard to bring quality work to you, the listener. Just like that, we intend to continue to do the same, so we will bring you top guests. Now, intermingled with these live shows, what you will hear will be some classics from the last few months that you may not have heard. People that you will enjoy, Some, sadly, unfortunately, some people who have passed away. And, of course, living legends such as Linda Moulton Howe, uh, Dr. Greer, and, and we do other things. For instance, Michael Dukakis will be joining us in just a few weeks. It'll be a closed show, meaning he does not want to take any calls. So, if you guys have any questions, send them to me. Now, let me say this. A few years ago, I tried to get him, and I brought up the UFO thing. He did not want to participate. So I had to wait and then, of course, do what he wanted to do. And we talked about politics. So you're going to hear some politics. Now, get this. The last sentence, he talked about the New World Order. He mentioned that Dr. or J George Bush was right. And remember, he ran against George Bush in I believe 88, that's right, 88, right after Ronald Reagan, and lost. And nonetheless, he said we, he agrees with George H.W. Bush that we need a new world order. And that, to this day, I get feedback from. So I will play that for you sometime soon. That way you can compare it to when I ask him about that. I can't go much in depth with him because... I'm afraid, you know, he won't come back, and he is a very esteemed guest because of who he was, and you could always keep learning from those who have lived in the past, especially former POTUS candidates. So again, I want to thank you, the listener. I want to thank our guests, of course, Uri Geller for the night, and of course, I want to thank uh, all the new people in the United Kingdom. We're also on the D program network where we are trying to get you late night in the midlands out there too and like i said of course mike farah and of course ira robinson not to forget my team there's six people making things happen behind the scenes so it is a team effort and we appreciate you all and we take guest requests very very seriously now remember like i said the name the only thing you have to remember Dr. J Radio Live, DRJ Radio Live. That's the same name for every social media account. Like I said, about 20-25% of the shows are posted on YouTube. So you could see them with amazing footage. Over 500 UFO videos provided by one and only Jaime Masson. And so you get to see a mix of those and some other stuff. Uh, but that's only a portion of them. There's a lot more that's not posted yet uh, because of time. But that's the name of the YouTube channel, Dr. J Radio Live. Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, Flickr, Tumblr, Google+, even Gmail, and of course the domain, Dr. J Radio Live. Dot com. With that being said, thank you all. Have a good uh, morning or good night, wherever you are, if you're on the west coast of the United States. Or to you, Jaffe, who happens to be in South Korea, listening to this right now. And, of course, our Swedish listeners and those in the United Kingdom, uh, whatever time you listen to this. So, uh, thank you all. Have a good night and good morning and good day. I'm signing off. Thank you.